says how he is. He's a loner. He likes working by himself. He likes doing it himself. You can't blame him. I mean, man, in his works, in the Garden of Eden, put us into a mess. A major mess. A mess he couldn't fix. Oh, he tried. He made fig leaves. I sometimes just sit and dwell on that particular scene. As he and Eve skirt around the garden, looking for a leaf big enough to cover their nakedness. You know, I, I, I kind of believe there wasn't a tree, a fig tree right there. They had to find one. Who knows how many leaves they ripped off other trees before they found one adequate. Great leaves are pretty big leaves. Great vines. They grow large leaves. Maple trees grow large leaves. We have an avocado tree in the backyard. They grow pretty large leaves. But as soon as you pick a leaf, pretty much the next day, it dries out as a brittle. But can you see Adam and Eve getting these leaves? Now how do we hold them on? Now I gotta get a, a, a vine or a branch and strip a stream of branch from it, put a hole in the leaf, and carefully tie it. You know? Just, just look at them. Call themselves helping God. They're you know, gonna make it better. They were in the process of producing a new product, a new manufacturer of leaves. They knew it didn't work because with the leaf on, when God came down and says they wouldn't have hid themselves, they had the trees. Who knows what they did they could have put a tree on themselves. We can't help God. We help God. We make a mess. So when God told Peter, although it looks like I'm washing feet, what I do now, what I do, I know it's not now, but thou shalt know hereafter, then just wait till he's finished. Does Peter do that? He's just like us. He's going to tell God something that he thinks God doesn't know. Why do we do that? Why do we attempt to fill God in on details of our lives as if God has no idea what's going on here? He's the one who declares the end from the beginning. He says things that are to come as though they already happened. And we dare instruct him. He said, I think it's in Romans, who have been his counselor, who has been his instructor. God said, I haven't took advice from anybody. And Peter's going to dare advise Jesus and tells Jesus, you know, to wash my feet and my hands and my head. Well, that's necessary. God would have done that. Right? Sometimes we pray. Your best thought telling God, although we already know, but you go through the procedure of telling God what's wrong. Stop there. He doesn't need you to tell him that, really. But when you pray and got problems, tell God your problem. Don't try to form the words in a certain kind of way. Pray a certain kind of way. One thing he hates when we pray, he says, use not what? Vain repetitions. Vain repetitions. Repeat the same thing over and over again. Tell God one time. He's smart. He won't forget it. Maybe that's God got it. He's got it. He knows your thoughts from far off. He knows you're going to pray about it before you pray. But as a father, 
He expects you as his children to tell him. Okay. But if you tell him what's wrong, don't insult his intelligence by telling him how to do it. He makes snowflakes. All of them are different print. He makes fingerprints. All of them different. How in the world can you advise God on how to fix your problem? Why would you do that? Your best effort. You ever, ever been in a committee, in a group meeting, and everybody's giving ideas, and you give yours, and somebody snickers? You know? <laughs> you laugh? Know Anybody ever in that situation? You don't understand until you've been there, right? It's a real lousy feeling. You know, stop and say, well, well why, why is that so funny? Let me proceed to tell you why. It was so funny. I think God does it every time we attempt to tell him how to fix it. When we attempt to tell God what we need. Tell God what you don't have, but don't tell God what you need. Okay? Tell God what's wrong, but don't tell God how to make it right. You tell him what's wrong, He'll figure out a way. He's just that smart. Don't tell God to wash your hands and your feet and your head, particularly when you see him washing feet only. They don't ask him what's he doing. Okay? Particularly he tells you, you're not going to know now. I'll tell you later. I can tell you how many years I have wondered about the scripture of Habakkuk when he said, throw a tear. Wait for it, because in the end, there'll be speak and not lie, and it won't tear. That wore me out. Then, the Lord know, why am I trying to figure that out? He said, you know, it's in the Bible, as I told you. And he was right. He said, I showed it to you. So when the time comes, I'll explain it to you. It could turn to figure it out. You're not going to go, know now, but you shall know hereafter. The strong delusion. I spent many hours trying to figure it out. Then God finally stopped me, so why are you trying to figure this out? You would know about a strong delusion Peter had told you. So I'm ready to tell you what it is. I'll tell you what it is. You're going to know, but not now. When did God first talk to us about the strong delusion? Back in 96. When did God explain the strong delusion? 2013. He said, you're going to know, but not now. Jesus said to him, verse 10, he that is washed, needeth not save to wash his feet. But is clean every whit. He's saying, I'm not washing your feet because they're dirty. I'm doing something you don't know yet, but you will know later. And, just to understand, Peter, and you are clean. So I'm not going to wash your head and your hands. I don't have to wash your feet, but I'm doing something. If you leave me alone, if you interrupt me, I'll do it. All we do is slow God down at our best. With our questions and our interests and our input and our ideas and our suggestions and so forth, you just slow them down. Let God do his work. I'm talking to somebody. He said, but not all, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore, he said he, you are not all clean. Now, this takes it to another scope altogether. The Bible tells us we are washed, or cleansed rather, by the washing of the word. Judas then becomes Judas overnight, Judas never heard the word. Judas got upset two times. The first time an alabaster box was poured over Jesus' head, and again, Judas said, put a silver 300 pence, which is a lot of money. 300 pence represents 10 months wages of a common man. He upbraided Jesus the first time. He said, the poor you have with you always, but not me. 
The second time it happened, you'd think Jesus has been quiet. If he didn't agree. But he spoke it the second time. And protested when Jesus was anointed for against his burial. Judas never realized who Jesus was. He never came to understand the value of having a Jesus in his life. And when Jesus spoke, John, when Jesus spoke, Judas was like the typical man, the sinner man, who agreed with some things Jesus said, and that makes sense. The other things, like, I don't know. That's just Jesus talking. When we do that with God, you are staying in the situation of being unclean. And that's why the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is such a grievous sin and unforgivable sin because it takes the word of God. Keep in mind, let me take that up from the, the root. The group he spoke that to didn't do it. There's a warning. Number one, the group that he spoke those words to didn't do it. Because one, the Holy Ghost was not yet given. So it would be impossible to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost while Jesus was on the face of the earth as a son. He warned them against it, but he didn't really tell what it was. You can get an idea of what it might be from the human logic. He had just done a work, and they took the work he did and ascribed it to the working of Beelzebub. So the bastard is the Holy Ghost then, would to be to take the word of God and ascribe it to another source. Got me? Yes. Primarily to ten. You all have come across well, I'll just come across. In some cases, you guys might have caused some, created some blasphemers. <laughs> Other than that. I mean, to see certain things that have been written in the videos, I am not, but never have been a, my opinion, preacher. Or I think. Or I feel. Or I believe. If the Lord didn't say it, I ain't saying it. I think y'all know it by now. If I say something in the name of the Lord, I'm going to give you the verse where the Lord said it already. I'm just wrapping up, writing on the feast days, which is a part of the last trump, but the very vital part of the book. A part of the book, in my opinion, is the most purest scripture part of the entire book. It's just pure word, nothing else. Anybody who knows his voice and to hear, to hear what the Spirit has said to the church should be able to read those writings and realize that this is not this man. So since so they can't say that, they accuse you all of worshiping the man. Can you imagine that? Well, that's wrong. But if you're going to be accused of that, you might as well worship somebody who's worshiping God <laughs> and promoting God, promoting Christ. Does that make sense? Yes. If you're going to worship me, you worship me for the fact that I worship him. That's right. And in my writing, Steve is nowhere there. I try constantly to use the word, not to use, not to use the word, I, my right, period, hard to do. Sometimes just force to look right, I. I would like to, if, Writing laws allowed it. Just right, I, I like to write it like this. Do it, why? Because there's no capital I in the world, except the Lord. 
He said, I am. <laughs> Some people washed their feet and have taken his garments and was set down again. He said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? There's a chance for Peter to speak up. He didn't. Because they didn't know. If you look at the writing, there's no space in there. It allows them to answer questions. Sometimes Jesus asks a rhetorical question to so them know they didn't know. You know? When they spoken to being the peril of the sword. Got to find that one, huh? Matthew 13. Turn to Mark. Not in there. Mark 4. understand it. The weird part about that, the crazy part is, in the book of Matthew, when he records it, they ask him, why do you talk to them in parables? Because you're losing them. They never said that we're lost. We don't understand it. And he explained it to them. He said, those who are without, I speak in parables. So the seeing they'll see not, hearing they'll hear not, nor understand. People can't conceive that of God. They can't believe that God would actually help you not understand his word. But he says, those who try to see with their regular eyes and figure it out with their regular brain, he says, I'm not speaking to them. But he says, those within, all the mysteries are given to you to know, right? But as I was here in verse 10, they didn't know. They asked of him a parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. How do you get converted by God? By hearing his word and letting God speak. Don't try to help God even be saved. Don't try to help God see, don't try to help God hear. Just let God speak to your heart, to your mind, to your ears, and you'll be converted and be saved. Let him work all by himself. And he said to them, Know you not this parable? Send me to the back here in John. When he said, Know you what I've done to you? Mark again. No, you're not. This parable. Let's hit it. When somebody, when he asks a question, so he asks how to get to Dodger Stadium. And somebody says, you know how to get to the or ring? Like he just caught the woodwork. So yeah, I know I'm just asking you because I don't. I hate that. That's the question, no? Where do you, uh, where, where, where do you change the money at, you know? Pesos to the American. You don't know? Ain't nothing worse than asking you you don't know when you tell them you don't know. Right? How do you cook pancakes? You don't know? I'm not playing I'm going to be asking you now. But Jesus didn't do it in the sense of you know somebody. He did the sense of making the person understand that they don't know. That's why I said here. He said to them, know you not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? By making them admit they didn't know this parable, he made them admit you can't know any parable unless you know this one. He's telling us this is a key parable. 
I'll back in John again. Know you what 